you know, gnomes have a lot of different uses, and I definitely have put them through it all. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs and the Idiot Quilter. and Welcome to my weekly vlog for Monday, August the 15th, 2022. Vlog number 276, and it is day 888 of COVID. Now, just before I carry on, a couple of things about today's date. One, August the 15th, well, this would have been my mother's 82nd birthday um, today. And as you know, my mother passed uh, in the fall uh, back in 2021 um so yeah it would have been her 82nd birthday um and you may still wonder why i'm doing a countdown of the days since covid started 888 that's how many's there i'm not going to stop doing this countdown until the word covid doesn't have any more fear for us because i'm sorry it's not over but we're becoming very lackadaisy uh, these days about taking precautions. And of course, now we have monkeypox. And if you saw Stephen and Walter live uh, yesterday, we talked a little bit about the uh, trending news that they have discovered polio in, I guess, wastewater in New York State. Um, and they're checking here in what the province I live in as well. What is happening to us? But anyways, I didn't want to start off on a depressing note. Let's move right into what I've been working on. And let me just find my picture here. And why is it that every time I want these pictures, they disappear? There they are. Okay. Doesn't look like much yet. But these are the pieces to my uh, Halloween quilt. Um, actually, since I've taken that picture, I have all the pieces done. And I have it all laid out. And today I'm going to start sewing it together. And then I can put on the borders and finish it all up. Um, I think it's going to look really cute. Um, it's a novelty quilt. I don't often make novelty quilts. But it's Halloween. And Hall of Halloween just screams novelty, I think. And there is a significance, as you may or may not know, with the bat blocks that are in this. Because you know that um, we have a little problem with bats here at my place occasionally a bat gets in the house and um well we have to capture it and let it go and i'm a little paranoid of them i i i'm not well yeah i am afraid of them and i don't know why i shouldn't be so i am conquering my fear by doing a quilt that features bats yeah that's my theory and that's my story and i'm sticking to it um anyways uh, I will show tomorrow on the Idiot Quilter a little bit more detail about this particular quilt design. And if you are a quilter and you really like this design, um, I will talk about the pattern as well tomorrow called Night Flight. And I bought it from the Fat Quarter Shop online. It was a PDF. I think it was $10 American for the pattern. And um, a lot of little pieces, but I think it's worth the effort. I really do. I'm, I'm loving it. Okay, so that takes me to a uh, YouTube channel of the week. And this one is for you techies out there. And I consider myself a techie as well. And it's called Tom's Tech Reviews. And, well, here's my review of it. This week's YouTube channel of the week is one that is called Tom's Tech Reviews. And I stumbled upon this one by accident when I was having a minor problem with my iWatch. And he showed me a very simple way to fix the problem I was having. And that video is right over here. Swipe up, down, fix. Um, I couldn't swipe up or down on my phone, on my iWatch. And he had a really simple fix for that. And it seems to be a common error. But that's how I found this particular YouTube channel. And I got looking through this. And there's a lot of really good videos here that are going to help you out with a variety of pieces of technology. So you can see here in his video list, he has things about how to replace ear pads on Boss headphones. Uh, can humans fly like a bird? That's interesting. Uh, how to change AirPods Pro name. Um, how to fix the iWatch, how to reset an iPhone. 
um, how to set up and transfer data from the iPhone, all kinds of a lot of really interesting uh, videos he has here. And it looks like he has some on here that are just for fun. Um, he's got a bit of a sense of humor uh, as well. Now, if we take a look at his playlist, how it's organized, um, he has a lot on tech, but he has a th few things on other topics as well, like his garden, uh, things like that, reviews. Uh, he talks about drones. It's just an endless variety of information um, about different high-tech products. So if you've got a high-tech product that you're having a problem with or one that you're thinking of buying, then I would suggest you check out Tom's Tech Reviews. And so you will find the link for Tom's Tech Reviews in the show notes below. You'll find a link for Stephen and Walter Live. I called it Disease, Doctors, and Depression. But actually, I'm sorry, but my titles tend to be clickbait. Um, I don't do that on purpose. Um, it's just that something like Stephen and Walter Live, we always digress. I mean, I need something in the title, right? And um, I do try to at least touch upon whatever's in that title. Um, but uh, yesterday we got off on talking about um, finishing a quilt or quilting a quilt in an embroidery machine. And I have some very definite opinions about that. And that's very apparent if you see Stephen and Walter live. But you know, other people talked about their experiences with that. And I thought it was a really good discussion. Um, for those of you that might be thinking of getting into machine embroidery, you would definitely be interested in what we talked about uh, yesterday on Stephen and Walter live. So check that out. And of course, we talked about a few other things as well. Um, I have an Idiot Quilter Presents. I interviewed last week Stephanie, um, Stephanie Stitches, uh, wonderful person. I'm hoping to do more with her in the near future, uh, along with Sean, the guy who sews, um, also another person I interviewed uh, a couple of months ago. But great interview, so there's a link to that interview in the show notes below, and I hope you will, if you've never heard of Stephanie Stitches, that you will explore uh, after you've seen that interview explore her youtube channel because she's got a wealth of information there and in fact she has some patterns that she has designed herself and i actually purchased one of her designs because i absolutely love it and i've talked a little bit about that last week on the idiot quilter and i may talk a little bit more about that uh this week when idiot quilter goes up um there is an idiot quilter episode as well uh, from last week. I talk about pattern storage and I talk about um, a new discourse server. Uh, and if you don't know what a discourse server is, I'm new to it. Um, but it's kind of like Facebook, except much more specialized. Um, you don't get advertising. You don't get the yahoos in there, that kind of stuff. They're people who share a common interest with you. There are hundreds, if not thousands of topics on quilts or on discourse server but um the one i've joined up one with is one that sean the guy who sews uh set up called um quilters co-op and i'm loving it i'm just it's it's a wealth of information uh everybody on there is really nice uh nice group of people and they're just very sharing so you know especially if you're new into quilting but it's good for anybody whether you're new into quilting or you've been around for 100 years in quilting there's something there for everybody so i do have a link uh if you go to the idiot quilter episode 179 you'll find a link to the quilters co-op discourse server and um on so chatty this past week we commented on comments that have been made during some of our uh episodes of so chatty um basically i use some of those as a springboard for other topics and i'll be very honest about it out of all of the videos i do every week so chatty is the one that i have the most difficult time with some weeks because I, some weeks i just don't have anything that i feel needs to be discussed on so chatty so you know if you're one of my followers on so chatty please Feel free to suggest some topics and things like that that we could explore further. Uh, we'd appreciate it. And having said that, I don't think there's going to be a so chatty episode this week. And that's because I'm off 
on a course, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and it's going to interfere with uh, my usual schedule. But more about that later. So that takes me to what things are looking like outside my window. And here we go. And it looks like it may be shaping up to be a nice day. I don't think it's going to be terribly hot. The highest, well, it could be. The highest set at 27. I have no idea what the Humidex is. It's not so much the heat. They always tell you this. It's the humidity. But boy, when we get some humidity here, that could put that 27 into the 30s. And that's not, that has not been unusual this summer in a lot of places in the world. And definitely uh, not unusual here where I live for this year. So we'll see what the day shapes up to be. And I just realized something. I have not been out of the house physically, and I mean outside of the house, in a week. The last time I was outside was last Monday when we went off to get our monkeypox uh, vaccination. Um, I need to do something about that. Well, I am getting out to a new environment for three days this coming week. Again, more about that later on. But anyways, yep, that's what things are looking like right now at uh, 7.02 this morning. Um, so it looks like it's shaping up to be a beautiful day. I should really take my sewing machine outside and sew. Yeah, maybe not today. Uh, don't want to work on the quilt outside there. Okay, so what's that leading me up to now? Well, what's pissing me off this week? My weekly rant. This isn't really a rant. This is an observation. <clears throat> uh, you saw the title of this week's uh, YouTube or this week's YouTube vlog. It was called Language Devolution. You know probably that I am a retired high school English teacher. I have a degree in English literature uh, as well. So obviously I like language. Um, but the thing about the English language is it is always changing, it's always evolving. <clears throat> it is one of the few languages in the world that actually creates new words. Um, it's a living language. It's constantly evolving. But lately, I've been seeing some things that, and maybe it's just because I'm an old retired school teacher, I've seen some things I'm really not fond of happening to our language. Now, this doesn't mean that I can do anything about it. And it doesn't mean that I feel that our language is becoming, well, yeah, I do feel our language is becoming corrupted. I'm a bit of a purist. But throughout history, and if you study English literature, you know the language has changed. I mean, Old English, Anglo-Saxon English, is unpronounceable, unreadable. Well, you can read it. Um, I had to study it a little bit when I was in university. I had to take a course in it. Believe me, it was not easy. Um, but we really do not know how it, it sounded because no recording devices back, you know, at uh, in the dark ages kind of a thing. So we have to guess. And of course, we've had the great vowel shift in history of language where the way certain words were said at one time shifted in sound. We've had Middle English. Middle English was a combination of Old French, Norse, uh, several Germanic languages and things like that, which was really part of the foundation of modern English. We have, you know, uh, Shakespearean English, which, you know, um, people didn't necessarily speak in poetry <laughs> all the time. Sure, they didn't. But there was new there were new words invented at that time period and brought into our language as well. Um, that is when spelling and grammar started to become standardized. Um, you know, people used to, uh, when they were printing, because printing was so expensive, that when they were laying out their type on a printing machine, they would sometimes either sh uh, take letters out of words to make them fit on a line or add letters to fit in a line because it was expensive. So you and paper was expensive. So, you know, you want to make the best use of it. So that's why we had weird spellings. Um, but of course, then things became standardized. Printing became what we think of it today. 
um, the way we produce physically produce text. So all of those things had an effect on our language. Also, technology. New inventions come along. The Industrial Revolution had all kinds of new uh, machines that were being invented and developed, and they needed a language to describe them and to describe the parts of them. So those words were created and put into our language. Um, and that's still going on today with computer technology. We are developing new words. Like, for example, 40 years ago, you would not have heard the term internet or YouTube or web as it's used today. Um, World Wide Web, all that kind of stuff. Uh, space technology, you know, when in the 50s and the 60s, when and into the 70s, when everybody was, you know, trying to get to the moon and whatnot, new technologies were developed for that. New words came into the language. Um, you know, take a word like smog. What is smog? Smog is a combination of smoke and fog. That became a word. That's a legitimate word in our language now. And words have changed as well. I mean, back when I was teaching, back in the um, early 80s and into the 90s, you'd often hear the kids say something was sick. Didn't mean it was ill. It meant it was cool. And, you know, music. Music has brought new words into our language as well. So there's all kinds of influences on the English language, which keeps it evolving and changing. But I have my pet peeves. And this is generated from when I watch YouTube videos. There are some expressions that make my blood boil. Now, before I talk about these, this is a criticism, but it's a pet peeve criticism. It means it bugs me. It probably doesn't bug other people. And there's nothing much I can do about it. And I am sure there are expressions that come out of my mouth that bug people and they might have a pet peeve with that as well. In fact, not so long ago, somebody took issue with the fact that I use the expression, whatever, uh, and they found that very dismissive. And yes, it is a very dismissive phrase. For me, it's more of a joke because <clears throat> if you remember back in the 80s, there was something called the Valley Girls. And they had a very special slang and a lot of comedy shows on TV like Saturday Night Live and things like that made fun of that language. Like, oh, my God, gag me with a spoon. Oh, that's so gnarly. Oh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, and one of those expressions that came out of that is whatever. Well, when my oldest niece was very, very little. Somehow she heard that expression somewhere, probably on TV, and she started to use it. And it was cute. I mean, it's kind of annoying too, but it was cute. And you'd say, she'd say, like, to dismiss you. And this is when she was like six or seven years old. She'd just look at you and go, whatever, <laughs> kind of a thing. So I kind of adapted it. And it became a joke in my family. So we would use that all the time. We Someone would say something, we'd go, whatever kind of a deal. So, you know, it was how it developed into my language. And now I kind of use it on a, well, I think I use it on a frequent basis sometimes. Um, so anyways, yes, it is a dim demissive type of term. And yes, it probably is very annoying. Now, I would never use it in a serious context. If I say it to somebody, I'm, it's in a, a funny context. At least I think it's a funny context. I hope it is. Um, you know, that kind of thing. But then sometimes, you know, what you think's funny and somebody else does, they don't get the humor inside joke kind of a thing with this whatever. But anyway, so yes, I probably have my idiosyncrasies, my expressions that I use that I don't even realize I use. And that does not mean I'm opening up the floodgates here for all kinds of the comments where you can say, you say this and you say that and you say that and that's annoying and don't say that and that's dismissive and that's okay because I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> and I'm sure nobody's going to listen to me about these things I'm going to talk about right now. But what, and I've done this in a sort of a roundabout way, but here's what I mean. One of the expressions that I hate when I, on a YouTube video is when people say, I love that. I'm loving that. Oh, 
I just love, love, love that. Love. That word, love. It's, to me, it doesn't really describe anything at all. Love is love. Okay. Whatever. I mean, oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. It's like, okay, you love everything then. If you're using that to be supportive and to be complimentary to somebody, um, if you use it too many times, it becomes meaningless, I believe. And that's my pet peeve with that expression. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Do you have a real opinion? Because that, if whatever is dismissive, I think using Oh, I love that is demissive in its own way, too, because it means, yeah, you'll just say that for whatever. What's your real thoughts about it? Another expression is, I feel like, which is seem to be replacing the term, in my opinion, or I think maybe something like that. It's just a new way of saying that. But let's think about this, for example. I feel like I might go to the grocery store today. I feel like I might go to bed early. I feel like I should be doing more exercise. Well, do you or don't you? Are you going to do this or are you not going to do it? It's not very definitive, is it? If I said to somebody, well, I feel like I might pick up uh some fabric well are you going to do it or aren't you going to do it and what's that feel like <laughs> what do you mean by that i feel like so that's just a, an expression i have a pet peeve with because it's not very definitive it doesn't really tell me anything about what your opinion is or how you're feeling at that moment in time so i think that is an over used expression it's also non-committal isn't it if you think about it well i feel like that's a, a nice car well do you like it or don't you like it give me your opinion give me your opinion come on don't mince words and then the word like and that's been happening quite a for a long time now like I was at the store like and I thought I'd like pick up some potato chips like because, you know, I really like them. But, you know, like, OK, I'm afraid like about the, the fat content and how many calories like I don't want to get fat and like I'd have to exercise more. But like, I really like them. Too many likes. Mm -hmm. That one bothers me more than anything else. It's like, 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 like. And you know what's happening? with that it's becoming acceptable in our language syntactically it is incorrect to say that in a sentence in the way that i just used it in a sentence that is grammatically incorrect um and that probably bothers me more than anything else is that and that's the english teacher and the english degree coming out in me with that and then another expression that really bothers me because it's more of a dialect y'all now i have caught myself saying that um hi y'all um y'all know what i mean right uh that is a word that we used to associate with you know southern uh expressions but you see it all over the place and i've seen it in writing now people are actually writing it y a apostrophe l l is becoming something common in written language and once oral language uh crosses over and becomes part of the written language it then becomes part of our language an acceptable part of our language and i wouldn't be surprised that if you picked up a uh, a new edition of the dictionary you will find y'all in it haven't looked I'm not even sure if I own a dictionary anymore. Uh, but, you know, it probably is become part of our language. Um, the reason I don't like that expression is, well, one, they, they talk today about cultural appro uh, appropriation. You know, if you run around wearing some Indigenous clothing and you're not Indigenous, then that's not appropriate. That's cultural appropriation. And 
that is not politically correct to do something like that. Well, if this word y'all has been a characteristic of the dialect of Southern American South, South, then if I use it, a Canadian, isn't that then a form of cultural uh, appropriation? Because really, I'm not a, I'm not a Southerner. I'm not a, an American Southerner. So I don't really have a right to use that word, given today's standards and controversy over cultural appropriation. So that's one reason why that word bothers me. There's another reason, and this is kind of derogatory. It makes you sound uneducated. Um, Y'all is not a con con contraction. It's not like the word didn't, haven't, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, when you use it, you sound kind of backwoodsy, in my opinion. Now, sorry, I, I don't want to associate saying backwoodsy with people who it's part of their dialect. But if we start taking it into ours, that is not something that has been common to our dialect, then it makes us sound like a bunch of rednecks. Kind of like that bunch, you know, the truck drivers who all invaded Ottawa back in the spring. You know, hmm. well, enough said about that. And one of the my biggest pet peeve, peeves, and this is because this came out of a certain amount of comedy as well, is ending a sentence with the word at. First of all, grammatically, at is a preposition. You never end a sentence with a preposition. Why? Well, it's the rule. Okay, but the rules are being are being broken, as we well know. But still, for me, you do not end a sentence with a preposition. That was drilled into me when I learned grammar. Um, so I listen to people say, so where's your party at? Um, where did you, uh, where did Johnny get at? Um, you hear it all the time. It's kind of like, like, <laughs> because people don't even think about it. And even me, I have caught myself ending a sentence with the word at. Now, here in our household, anytime Walter and I are watching a YouTube video or even a television program and someone ends a sentence with the word at, we put another word right at the end of it. In fact, it's an automatic for us to the point where if we're out somewhere and talking to somebody and they do that, we will add this word to the end of it. Well, what's this word? Well, let me back up. Walter bought me a birthday card many years ago. On the cover of the birthday card were two ladies at a bar having a drink. One lady says to the other lady, where's your party at? The other lady says, don't end a preposition, don't end a sentence with a preposition. You open up the card and the other lady who started the conversation says, where's your party at, bitch? <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. I thought that was hilarious. So what I did was I used that in my grade 12 English class. And these were kids that were going, were bound for university. So they were taking the uni university level grade 12 senior English. Of course, I had to go back to basics with them about grammar because now it became important to them when they realized they were going to university and they would have to write essays and that university professors were not going to let them get away with incorrect syntax and grammar. So I used to teach basic grammar at the grade 12 level. Didn't mean I didn't teach it at the other levels, but for some reason, when they hit grade 12 and realized they were graduating from high school and going on to the big wide world out there, they suddenly they took more of an interest in it. So I had a picture of this card. I put it up on the board and um, explained to them why they should not end a sentence with a preposition and that at was a preposition. I had explained what a preposition was and everything else uh, like that too. And I told them, I do not want to see in your essays that come into me. I do not want to see you trying to correct a sentence that you ended with at by putting bitch at the end of it. You want to know something? And you're not going to believe this. 
every semester, I would have at least one essay would come in and the student did that and they weren't trying to be funny. They only heard part of what I told them or only absorbed part of it. So in their little pea brain, <laughs> they really thought that the way to correct a sentence that ended in at was to stick bitch at the end of it. Woo. Okay. So anytime somebody says to us, ends a sentence, so where's your party at? Walter and I both in harmony, just go, bitch. It's second nature to us to do that. And that's maybe not a good thing when people don't know you very well, okay, or don't know the story behind it. So, yeah. So these are all things that bother me about our language. Do I speak perfectly sound grammar every day in every sentence that I deliver? No, I'm sure you have noticed that. But as I used to tell the students in my classes, there is a difference between conversational English and written English. It also depends on your audience. When you're talking with your friends, you can get away with bad grammar because they can understand you clearly because there's context. They know you, all of that. But when you're in an interview for a job or for entrance into a university or someplace like that, you don't want to take the chance because you don't know these people. You want to put your best foot, foot forward. So that means you need to speak properly and write properly. If you're jotting off a note to your husband, your wife, or your kid about something you want them to do later in the day, eh, grammar, as long as it gets the message across, doesn't really count. No one's marking you on that one. But if you're writing an entrance exam into a university or, a, or writing your resume or whatever, yeah, it counts then because it says something about you as a human being. And essentially, that's what language does. Language does define who we are for people who don't know who we are. So when in doubt, fall back on the, on the standard rules for grammar and for language, and you can't go wrong. Down the road, when you're in a more comfortable environment, yeah, break the rules a little bit. Who's going to care? Except a retired high school English teacher like me. Okay, so that takes me to product reviews and things like that. Well, I did buy a couple of things and I just want to get these up on my screen for you. Just bear with me for a second. And yeah, here we go. So let me switch my camera over. I I bought a case for my Microsoft Surface Pro. Um, the Surface Pro tablet is what runs the Quilt Path, the computerized software for my long arm. And normally it is mounted on the long arm, so I don't really need a protective case for it. But later this week, I'm going on a three day intensive course to learn how to use the Quilt Path program. And I need to bring my tablet with me. So I thought I should invest in a protective case. And this one came highly uh, recommended. It wasn't a bad price, $37.99. I mean, you can spend $100 or more on a case, depending on what you want. And since I'm not going to be using this a lot of times, I just wanted something for transporting my tablet to the physical setting I'm going to be in for this class. So I got this one. It had a fairly good review. And yep, I like it. It fits my uh, Surface Pro 7 with no problem. There's a place for it, as you can see up here, for the uh, stylus that comes with it. Uh, some other features that it has, it has this uh, multi-position kickstand at the back, which is good because the Pro that I have does not have uh, any way of propping it up. And I think this will be very handy for this course I'm taking. Um, and yeah, it seems to be, it's fairly rigid plastic that's on it. Um, it's maybe not as good as those ones they call armor or something like that. But um, it will serve the purpose, I think, for what I need at that price. So that's one thing I bought. And then another thing that I bought 
is not that. Where is it? Here it is. This. And you might say, what the heck's that? You giving yourself your own vaccinations now? No, it is not a needle. It is a precision oiler. It looks like a pen. You fill it with oil. Uh, in my case, I'm using sewing machine oil. And it allows you, by pressing the button at the end of it, to get one drop of oil out of the end of it. Now, why is that important to me? Well, that's important to me because when I clean my sewing machines, there is a part underneath the bobbin that uh, needs to have a drop, one drop, that's all you put in, of oil. Now, if you're using the little plastic bottle sewing machine oil comes in, um, it's very easy to have more than one drop, and that makes a bit of a mess. Uh, also, they have a very long tube that is the nozzle for the oil bottle. And as your oil gets down in the bottle, it uh, it takes, you know, like you got to maneuver it and squeeze the bottle a little bit more to get the air out so oil will come out. And in the process, process of doing that, suddenly you get more than one drop. Ask me how I know. So I saw this, I think it was Lynn Reidhard. I was watching one of her YouTube videos. She had some little short ones on Cotton Art Studio. And she said this was one of her favorite tools. She didn't though put a link to where you could get it and she didn't really say what it was. So I did a search on Amazon and I found it. Um, it's not particularly inexpensive. I mean, $21 plus tax, it cost me about $24 Canadian. But I got it the other day and it works dandy. I'm loving it. So if you've got something that where you need to really be precise about how much oil you're giving something, this seems to fit the bill for that. Um, in fact, I was showing it to Walter and he decided to order one for himself as well. So yeah, I guess I'm an enabler in that case. So that's what's new for products. And what have I been working on in um for my 3d printer well again let me find my pictures here and i can show you and go over here and here we go so what's this a gnome of course it's a gnome but this is a gnome cell phone stand um well it was supposed to be I'd have to redesign him a little bit slightly because you see where his beard is. And I know the picture's a little dark. His beard in here. Well, when you put your uh, cell phone in it uh, in portrait mode, uh, it might have a tendency to fall over <laughs> because that needs to be back a little bit further. Works dandy though when it's in landscape mode. Um, but it also takes a long time to print. To make this print, it takes about a day and a half. It takes about 36 hours to print. Um, somebody suggested that that might be a good thing for me to develop. And they were right. But um, this one, I have to redesign. However, having said that, I already have one that works really well. He's slightly different. Let me show you here. This guy. He works fine. I made him some time ago and forgot all about him. Uh, it doesn't take as long to print. Um, and your cell phone sits in him. It sits in this very well. Also, it'll hold business cards or a sticky notepad. So this one's more versatile than the other guy. Now, this is a different gnome. He's not Gus the gnome, as I showed you a moment ago. Uh, he's cute, though, too. But I could do it with Gus. So will I? I don't know. I don't know if it's worth the effort. I mean, how many of these do I need? And I know someone's going to say, well, you could sell them. Yes and no. And I've talked about why I don't sell things uh, before for a variety of reasons. So I'm not going to get into that now. But anyways, I did create that. Now, another thing, though, that I've been working on, and I'm making more of these because I think they may become quickie Christmas presents. Uh, let me switch over here. There we go. Gnome jars. These are, got Gus the Gnome is on the front of them. I'm making them in different colors and they have a screw on lid. They are a jar, but they are very versatile. You could use these for a variety of things. I'm thinking if I give them as Christmas gifts, I will fill them with some wrapped candy. 
uh, in there, uh, you know, wrapped up chocolates or something like that. You're going to say, well, why wrapped? Well, because, you know, things in a jar can stick together. Also, this is PLA plastic, which is actually made from cornstarch. So it is biodegradable. Uh, but I'm not really sure about food safety, food grade. There are plastics that are food grade. This one is sort of, but I just wouldn't want to take the chance of, you know, putting in something that's not wrapped or put it or in a bag. Um, you know, don't want to kill people. Um, not my plan. So uh, I would just put in wrapped candy, hard ca Christmas candy or something like that. Or, you know, even like Hershey's Kisses, you know, they come out with the ones in different colors at Christmas time and things like that. It's just kind of fun. And somebody could use this container for other things, you know, hold pens or pencils, the cap off, paper clips, you know, office supplies. Um, they're not a bad size for that. S sewing notions, whatever. So I'm making a bunch of these. They take a while. They take about a day to print. And then I have to print the cap separately um, with that. And they take half a day for the cap or so, 12 hours, whatever. So this is not a fast process. But if I'm giving them at Christmas, I have lots of time, don't I, for this. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I've been doing on the 3D printer. Always doing something on it. So that takes me to Blast from the Past Trips. And this is Adelaide Day 5, February the 21st, 2018. And this is part two of this series I've been showing you. Some of the birds. Don't know what kind of birds these are. They have red heads. All pecking out at something here. Let's see you get a little closer. Okay, so we're standing in a street into a park with a bike path. Yeah, if, you path. Like if you go straight down here, you go down there. If you follow the bike path, you hit the zoo. Okay, but there's two bike paths. This one is, this is one. See, look, this is the road. This is Hackney Road. And we just came off of... Yeah, hang on. Fuck this. Hang on. That's Bundy's Road. That's this here, right? Yeah. So you go Bundy's Road to Finistry, and you can get to the zoo there. You go down this trail here, yeah. you get to the zoo. Okay. Or, wait a minute, or you go down there, and then you go to the zoo. Or I guess you go down straight down there. And then there's another road that takes you to there. Okay, go there. Remember, if you find our dead bodies, we're from Canada. Send us home. Yeah. Okay, so this is Adelaide Zoo, and we decided we're not going to bother because we've seen a lot of wildlife already on this trip. Plus, a zoo is a zoo, and I do have a little problem with zoos. See animals caged up and things like that. I don't know. Plus, it's an expensive zoo. It's thirty-five dollars a person. Well, so. it's not expensive. That's both. Well, I suppose now I have no idea what the metro zoo costs these days. Probably the cost about the same. But I mean, but what we, are we going to see? Tigers yeah, I know. And, Tigers, lions, and bears. Oh no. We've seen them everywhere. Yes. And we've and seen, seen kangaroos. And then there's the rare wally beast, which is now bent over in his natural habitat, tying up his shoe on his hoofy. Beware of the Wally Beast. They usually walk behind you and sneak attack. And they have pandas, but we have pandas. Yeah, we've seen pandas. We saw we pandas, saw in, pandas Beijing. in Beijing. And they so. have at the Metro Zoo, although we didn't see them at the Metro Zoo. But I mean, they're just a big teddy bear anyways. Okay, let's go someplace serious, like back to the National Wine Center for Chicutari Okay, a second ago, if I got my camera up quicker, you would have saw a really pretty bird up in that tree there with all the other stuff. But probably can't get it up there fast enough because we are now coming out of the National Wine Center. Two and a half hours later, after uploading some, three videos, uh, what I do for you people, really. 
and two bottles of wine. Yeah, so we're a little sloshed. So we're a little sloshed. So I may not be taking videos for a bit because it may be very wonky. Um, but now we're on our way to the Central Market, I guess. Whatever. Well, you'll see. Okay, this is the Central Market in Adelaide. And of course you can see it's a lot of fruit and vegetables and things like that. And it wasn't open the first day we got here because, well, we came too late and it was closed it was on a Saturday. It's not open Sundays and Mondays, but it is open on Tuesdays. And the prices are good here. And Walter says the prices are good here. So, it's sort of like the St. Lawrence Market in Toronto. Yeah. How much are their cashews? Well, they're uh, uh, 10 bucks. No, but their bananas are $1.99. Yeah. Yeah, they work to us. Mango is too free. That's kind of pricey. That's kind of pricey. $4.50 a piece. Yeah. 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 Ten dollars a kilo, and then I saw a dollar ninety-nine a kilo. Kilo or kilogram? Kilogram. For bananas? Yeah. No, for grapes. Oh. Well, that's, that's expensive. But over at Coles, they were only um, five dollars for a kilogram. Yeah. So it depends. Which is two pounds. I think we pay about three, two ninety nine, three ninety nine. No, three dollars. Two four. Well, we can't because we have to fly. Yeah, you know, seems to be. Oh, they close at five thirty. Is it five thirty? So we're down here in the closed section. Oh, more life down here. Okay. Uh, so what are we have for dinner? I don't know what you want. We're full of wine and charcuterie. Charcuterie. Yeah. You're talking about tacos. Yeah, well, oh, you're talking about get, that. We'd have to get some. So we have to get hamburger for that. Actually, we need a lot of stuff. Yeah. Fish meat, green pepper. We still have dips and stuff. Yeah, well, maybe we just eat those. Of course, we don't know what those dips will taste like, but because yeah. <laughs> we bought weird dips. We have Nan. Yeah. Eggs, Benny. Cheese. We still have some cheese. Oh, the lobster is this place too. Meat. Oh, there's stores down there. And then what's upstairs? Well, there's lots of variety here, as you can see, so we'll explore some more. Okay, down here, it looks like we stumbled upon some filming for maybe a TV show or something. Just like a cooking show. Maybe a little filming. Guess we can't run in and be celebrities. If I've had another bottle of wine, I probably would have. Mm -hmm. So this is like a Chinese market in here. Is that? Cool. Rows and rows of things that you don't know what they are. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if it was actually already made up, I would probably not notice something over China chess. But this is China China. Yeah. Well, it's not actually China. Yes, it is. This is a Chinese show. Okay. It is Chinatown. Oh, is this actually Chinatown? Okay. Yeah.
there's all kinds of oodles of noodles and walk off. <laughs> and let's steam with your bamboo steamer because you can't have too many of those. All kinds of other fun things. You know, I bet they're all made in China. Okay, this might be a little sad, but you might think we're fabulously eating out, out every night. We're not. We bought a bottle of bolognese sauce at the local Kohl's. Walter is heating up water here and the sauce to make cheap pasta with a baked Caesar salad. Of course, today at lunch, we spent like over a hundred dollars on could could I can't say it now. Charcuterie. That's it, charcuterie. And a couple of bottles of wine. But that's only so I could upload these videos to you. So that's today. Tomorrow, this is our last day in Adelaide. And we are going to get on a flight to go to, where are we going? Perth. Oh, Perth. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Think about that. And that takes me to events in the past week. Well, how's our garden doing? Fantastic. Um, we're pretty much done with our lettuce. It all bolted because uh, we weren't eating it fast enough. Bolting means it goes to flower. And once that happens, it becomes tough and bitter. Uh, we have started some more by seed. Uh, some of it's coming up, but not as fast. And I have a feeling that we may not get much more out of it before the end of the season. However, one thing that I'm really proud of is this. We have red peppers. Now, this was a plant that Walter bought back in the spring. Uh, we've already had one pepper off it that we ate. Uh, it was a green one. These started off as green, uh, but they turn red, as you can see. Now, it takes a long time and i think i have a new appreciation for why red peppers are more expensive than green peppers because for a green pepper to become red it takes 85 days so it says on the package so you can see i've got that one is right there it's just a thing of beauty i don't really want to pick it but i also don't want it to rot on the vine so i will have to pick it soon but i thought i'd take a picture of it and you can see there's another one in behind it that's turning red and i have a few more on this plant now we have another plant that Walter planted from seeds. It's now, it's a nice luscious green and it's just start to get flowers. I don't know if we're going to get peppers off of it. I know for sure we're not going to get big peppers like this because the growing season just, there isn't enough of it left, I think, for that. We might get a few small green peppers uh, at the end of it. But now that we know that we can actually grow these, I think the plan for next year would be to put in more pepper plants and not grow them from seed, but grow them from, you know, by the, the small little plant in the springtime, put more of them in so we'll have more peppers. Uh, you know, I wish there was a way that you could preserve a pepper just like this right off the vine um, and just so that it never rotted in your refrigerator or something like that. But I don't know of any way to do that. Yeah, you can chop it up, make it into something. You could chop it up and sort of freeze it, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But it's just not the same, is it, as a fresh pepper. So, yeah, I thought that was great. And I'm glad I have a picture of it. It's a good picture of my red pepper. <laughs> yeah. And, okay, let me bring me back to me. Um. So, as I mentioned earlier in today's episode, we did get the monkeypox vaccine because we could. And we want to be proactive about this. Um, there's more and more cases of monkeypox. And although catching monkeypox is a little bit more, so they're saying, a little bit more difficult than, say, something like COVID, nevertheless, it's COVID all over again. Cases are increasing around the world. You know what's going to happen? Suddenly, everybody's going to panic. They're all going to want the vaccination. And our government, anyways, here in Ontario, will screw it up, just like they did with COVID. There won't be enough vaccination or enough vaccine. Um, 
There'll be people who don't want to get the vaccination for whatever reason. Uh, the government will try to set up a system, you know, and certain groups can get it first, other groups later on, and that'll all be mucked up because they mucked it up during COVID. And we know from history, something that our governments do not learn from, that they will muck it up again because they don't pay any attention to their mistakes before. So Walter and I had the opportunity, so we got it. And yes, we did have reaction to it. Now, Walter wasn't feeling quite 100% before we got the shot. In fact, to the point where he thought he might have had COVID. <clears throat> he did two tests before. Um, we got the monkeypox uh, vaccination, and they both came up negative um, over a period of days. Actually, in hindsight, he thinks he may have had a bit of a cold. And apparently, co colds are happening again now. Um, because everybody was wearing a mask for a couple of years, um, people weren't getting colds quite the same. So I've read. And um, I know I didn't, but then I don't usually. Yeah, I might every now and then, but I don't get it on a frequent basis. Um, but anyways, so he may have had that because he was feeling tired. He did run a temperature uh, before we got the monkeypox vaccination. Uh, a little bit, which was sort of worrying, but it disappeared fairly soon. Um, but anyways, so we got the shot. Well, now Walter didn't know for the, the good part of last week, he was still feeling really tired um, and not quite right. Um, I felt okay, except I felt really tired 24 hours after I got the shot and fatigue is one of the side effects uh, we read about the monkeypox uh, vaccination. Um, but I did get something else. I got hives on my feet. I've never really had hives before. Well, Walter said they were hives. To me, they look like small blistery kind of things. They weren't open sores. That's kind of gross. Uh, they were red. They look like big red zits. And they were itchy. But I avoided scratching. They're gone now. They only lasted two or three days. But apparently that is one of the side effects as well of monkeypox vaccination. So I never had any kind of reaction to the COVID once, but I guess I did have a reaction in the monkeypox. But anyways, that's over with. I'm fine. So I just feel a little bit more secure that I've had that vaccination. Of course, having said that, and we talked about this yesterday in Stephen Walter Live, Apparently now they're saying they're not absolutely sure whether this vac vaccination protects you or not. Something just fell. And I'm not really sure what it was. But it sounded like it fell off of my 3D printer. I have to investigate that shortly. Okay. So anyways, uh, yeah. And what else? Oh, yeah. We had pop-up so day on Saturday. That was fun. Some new faces on that. Some other faces. At one point, it was becoming YouTube Celebrity Day because we had Stephanie Stitches was on and Adam Sows. And I was really appreciative that both of, of those people joined in and uh, really contributed quite a bit to the day as well. Um, people have asked me when's going to be the next pop-up so day. Well, they're called pop-up for a reason. I never know when they're going to happen. I usually don't know until 24 hours before. Where Will there be another one this month? Maybe. Not really sure. Um, I try to have at least one a month. They're always on a Saturday when I have them because that's for the people who can't make it to craft and chat that I have once a month, uh, because they have something annoying, like a job, <laughs> you know, they like to eat, I guess, and have a shelter over their head and clothes. Um, go figure that out. Eh? Um, but, um, when I do have the next one, I usually give you 24 hours notice. Well, for sure, it'll be at least 24 hours notice. And I will post it, uh, a special short little video announcement on here on the YouTube channel. And if you're in or on my mailing list for Pop-Up So Day, you will get an email with the Zoom link and everything in it. I don't know, as I said, when the next one's going to be. So stay tuned. Okay. And by the way, speaking of mailing lists, I do have three. I have one for Pop-Up So Days, one for Craft and Chat, and one for my retreats. 
if you want to be on any or all of those mailing lists, and I don't send out stuff except only about those events, I do not inundate you with the emails and things like that. Uh, it's very business-like, you know, craft and chat reminder with the Zoom link. You get that email a few days before craft and chat. Same with pop-up. So, and with the retreat, you may get a few more emails from that, but that will be to keep you updated on what I have planned. Um, and speaking of the retreat, I've already mentioned this before, but I'll mention again, my fall retreat, which is a free one day retreat with guest speakers, prizes, games, and me, <laughs> right, um, is absolutely free. And it will be October the 22nd. That is a Saturday. It will start probably about eight o'clock in the morning, run till about five or six o'clock at night. I'm still working out my details. And come about mid-September, I intend to send out a an announcement uh, email, and I'll have uh, more of a detailed explanation of it on um, Idiot Quilter and my vlog as well. Um, that'll be sometime in the middle of September. And there will be registration required. Although it's free, I can only handle at the most about 95 people. Um, so if you would like a spot on it, then once I send out the information about how you register for it, and it's, it will be very easy to do so, then um, you'll be able to do that. And that guarantees you a spot. Okay. But more about all of that in another month, about in around the middle of September, I will give you everything you need to know and then some about it all. Okay. So what's coming up this week? Um, I already mentioned I'm going to a uh, three-day intensive course on how to use Quilt Path, which is the computerized software for my long arm machine. I'm really looking forward to this. I think my head will be spinning uh, because this is a very powerful program, and that's why I'm taking this course. Not a cheap course. It's costing me over $600 for the three days, but there is an expert who will be there um who runs courses like this all the time she's from the states uh angela clark um i think she even had something to do with the development of this software program so it should be really good uh with that and i'm really hoping to learn a lot um and i have a whole bunch of questions that i'm hoping to have the answers to as well so after this course is over, I should be able to do more exciting things with my long arm quilting. Okay, so that's it for this week. And I hope you have a great week. I hope the weather remains nice. Uh, we're moving into, what do they call it? The dog days of summer, I guess. And then before you know it, we hit the fall. And well, let's not think about that, shall we? Um, so have a great week. Um, and we'll see you later. Bye for now.